time of worship. <sighs> Gosh, I'm so glad that we are part of a Pentecostal church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, um, every t I meet different people at different times and they talk to me about your church and, you know, and I, I try, how do I explain it to them? I'm saying, well, you know, a bit more of a happy clappy sort. And they talk about, and, and one of the things I say to them is like, well, if I'm a pastor, it means I have to be there every week. And if I have to be there every week, it means it has to be fun. Otherwise, I'm not going. So uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm praising God that I got saved into a Pentecostal movement like the Australian Christian Church is in a, which means I get to come each week because it's fun and we miss out when we're not here, hey? Amen. So we're just starting a series called Serving God. Now, I love this idea of serving God because it's one of those, it's one of those um, topics that can be a little bit contentious. And if you know anything about me, I don't mind a little bit of contention. A little bit of a uh, debate amongst friends is pretty, is, yeah, it's actually one of those um, strengths I had to get under control. You know, you know the, like your greatest strengths is your greatest weaknesses. Well, I, I praise God, I'm pretty sure I, I'm a lot better than I was, but I still don't mind letting the, um, the old gray matter get to work to, to understand about different perspectives. And when, one of the things with serving God is we get the, the different views on it and there's different ways of looking at it. And we see some people even abuse the idea of serving God. We see it often misused. We see people ret run from it. We see people um, take, take it on board and get passionate and love it. And, and what I would like us to do this, as we launch this series is to see, is to really get a biblical perspective. It's like, what does God say about serving him? You know, there's one thing about, like, there's this uh, concept called the five love languages. And the idea with that is, is each person has particular ways that they hear the message, I love you. Now, if there's, if, if you're telling somebody that you love them in a way that doesn't gel with them, a really good understanding of that is some people love gifts. And if, um, can I get water, please? If you've got, and if that person gets a gift, they are just feeling so loved. Other people love to spend time with people. And if you spend time with them, they are feeling so loved. And there's a really good analogy where a, a dad with two daughters and one of them, he would always, like, and, and one of them was a, just loved getting gifts and the other was a time person. But the dad just, he was a gifts person. He used to come and just give them both gifts. And the, the one who loved gifts, she just felt so loved by her dad. And that was, and she just was walked around, knew that her dad loved her, had such a sense of worth, such a sense of a healthy sense of importance, such a healthy identity, where the other one had, felt like her dad was trying to buy her love, trying to pay her off, trying to, where she was not feeling loved, she was actually feeling mistreated because the dad was communicating to her, serving her in a way that wasn't how she wanted to be served. And so I think if we're going to be focusing and committing to serving God, we should really pro probably try to understand how he wants to be served. Hey, amen. So that's what we're going to do this morning is we're just a really layered platform of what does God say about serving him? Um, now, the, the real uh, scripture that I think we're really going to sort of hinge this whole series on is Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, and it says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Whatever you're doing, do it like you're working for God. So what we can start to see right there is everything you do is serving. doesn't matter where you're contributing. Is serving God. Whether you're sweeping up your own mess, whether you're sweeping up after your kids, whether you're at work, it is serving God. And how you do it matters. So, the next thing I want to do is I just want to quickly, uh, I'm just, everything, the most important thing that, that matters to God with when we serve Him 
is that we do it out of love. It matters. It matters. Now, one of the funniest things is uh, I caught myself doing this just yesterday uh, on Friday. For those that don't know, during the week I work with um, with the homeless, and it is such a privilege to, to like it's just it, I'm constantly reminded of, of just what a blessing it is to just to serve people that can't give back and. Except I'm there. I'm doing. I've got to get through some paperwork and some statistics, some statistics, and because I, I oversee the centre, so a lot of what I do is the behind the scenes work. And I mean, the, some afternoons, one of the guys was off sick, so I was at the front desk, and I've got people coming, and they want food because they're starving and they haven't eaten, and they, you know, and they're coming for food, like the most basic resource you can. Pop, and then they're coming, and I'm trying to get my paperwork done, and they're there, and I'm trying to do it, and then they keep knocking on the door asking for this most precious basic resource and I'm finding myself getting annoyed I'm like would you stop bothering me homeless people because I'm trying to help homeless people and I'm like and uh, as I, I did as I as I you know I just had to catch myself and I had a laugh I'm like wow you know it's like that's not cool like, that's not cool. And, uh, and and it matters. Like, it matters. And there's, you know, and, and that's like, okay, cool. Now, it's pretty amazing. Like, it, it's very clear and succinct when you've got somebody that needs food and you're saying person with, you know. And, but, you know, why do you clean your house? I need to have my house clean for my kids, for my family. Kids, get out of the way. I'm trying to clean for you because I love you. Get out of the way. Smash him with a vacuum cleaner. You know, who, if, if any husbands here ever got like scars on your ankles from vacuum cleaners banging up against them because you're like, you know, not moving fast and I'm probably different, how, not my house. I've heard this from other families. You know, it matters. It matters. Why are you cleaning your house? Are you doing it for love? Because you love your family or are you doing it for... Who know, I don't know. I'm just saying, if you're doing it because you love your kids, you're not smashing them with the vacuum cleaner. Just saying. <laughs> get out of the way. Get. I'm trying to get over, get to church so I can help people connect with Jesus. Honk, honk. <laughs> Hurry up. You're in my way. I need to go and tell people how much Jesus loves them. Cut them off in traffic. Ugh, give them the Jesus loves you sign. <laughs> you know, it matters. It matters. And this is like, you know, we sort of, and, we, and, as, and as we're stepping into this idea, this has to be the platform that's like, right, you know, just take one step back. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Why are you serving God? Why are you serving people to serve God? And we have to take that step back. And it takes a lot of, lot of the pressure off. Like it really does. Like it takes... In the sense, one of the sense it takes it off because you, it takes perfection away because you can't do any of it perfectly. Does not mean we don't strive for excellence. Doesn't mean we don't strive to do things well, but it does mean you will be inconvenienced and it does mean you have to be okay with the inconvenience. You have to be. You have to be. <laughs> There's a guy in the Bible where Jesus was going to, raise someone's kid was sick in the house and if you're a parent you know there is nothing more important than your kid being like than your kids and in the situation where your kid is sick personally the most worst times i've ever had most fear i've ever experienced is when my kids have been sick this guy came to jesus and said jesus come and help my kid and jesus is on the way to help the kid and a lady with another set of problems comes and jesus stops to help the lady and the guy's there, I'm sure he's thinking, what about my kid? The clock is ticking on my kid, but Jesus is stopping. And, and Jesus teaches us in that moment, he stops and he heals the woman. And yes, things went wrong. The kid died. Jesus carried on, rose the kid from the dead. Jesus can do resurrections in your inconveniences. Don't stress. Don't stress. And God's really... One of the things we have to understand with when we're doing it God's way is we move to this concept where to really, 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 oh, come on. Jesus, the life, the very life of Jesus, 
it started with Joseph and it ended with Joseph. It started with Joseph, so it thought, it said, in, if you, I think it's Luke's gospel, it says Jesus, and goes through the lineage of Jesus, was the son of Joseph, so it was thought. So it was thought. Then it ended in a borrowed tomb. Ended, so it was thought, in a borrowed tomb. So it was thought, that was the end. And it was bookended with these two, so it was thought, Joseph's. Now to really understand this Joseph, do you know what the word Joseph means? Jehovah will add. God will add. The whole life of Jesus, the whole ministry of Jesus was about God will add. So when we're doing and walking in step in serving God, everything we're doing is God will add. The full bookend of Jesus. So it was thought human life was, was wrapped between the concept, the, 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 the notion, the revelation that God will add. And everything he did, all the pressures on God, none of the pressures on him. So when he's cleaning the house for his mum, where I'm sure he did it because he was a good kid, you would assume. And there's time pressures and someone needs help with food, even though there's food on the, you know, you know the inconveniences. Jesus never worried about the inconveniences because he knew God will add. We read, there's a story where Mary and Martha, where it's, a, it's a very well-known story where Martha's like, Jesus, we've got to get stuff done. Mary's here doing nothing. And Jesus is like, no, she's right. God will add. Don't stress. And then God wants us to serve with that paradigm. This is where he wants us to approach him. And so from starting from there, now we're brought into this concept of serving God, understanding that it's on his timetable, it's on his, where he's carrying the pressure. And we, it brings us to this passage where, you know, we started Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Really cool understanding of that concept. It's actually talking to slaves about their masters. So it's probably in the most horrific, inhumane context possible. And it's saying, yeah, in that situation, it's like, yeah, but what my, my boss is terrible. Yeah, but he's saying, here, this is a person that owns you, bought cash, paid cash for your body and your children. Yes, for that person, work for them like you're working for me. Yeah, but my school teacher's a pain. Yeah, for that person. And he goes on, uh, not for human masters. Since that you know you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. We don't serve to get the reward. We serve for love. But you will get a reward. You don't serve to get the reward. You serve for love. But you will get a reward. There's a scripture in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, don't be an idiot. You can't do good without getting good. It says, as a man sows, so shall he reap. God, don't try and make a fool of God. You can't give to God without reaping. And that's what this is saying. It's like we're not doing it to get something, but you will get something. Uh, the, 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 the passage we love to read at weddings is, um, if I speak with tongue, in the tongues of men, in the men or of angels, but I do not have love, I am only resounding gong or symbol, clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. It has to be done in love, church. It has to be. Serving God out of love is not serving God. It is not serving God. If it's done out of love, it is not serving God. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, and that that I may boast is so key because some of the times you're smashing the walls and your husband's ankles with the vacuum cleaner is not because you love your family it's so you can boast about having a clean house. For some of the times when you're telling the, you know, your, the kids you teach at school to be quiet so you can finish your papers or the homeless people that are trying to get food from you and you're telling them to go away so you can finish your papers is not because you can serve them better, it's because you want to get a nice pat on the back from your boss or you want to get your results at the end of the that they all squared away so you can sleep better on a Friday night because your paperwork's done. It's, it's, why is that? So I can boast. So I can boast. It's me. 
I care what people think about me. No, <laughs> this is nah, wrong answer. Wrong answer. But have not love. I gain nothing. What are you going to gain? We just read about that in Colossians. An inheritance from the Lord. <laughs> if it's done in love, there is an inheritance from the Lord. There is a reward. We don't do it for the reward. We do it for love. But we know that when we serve God, there is an inheritance. There's another place where it's just, it says that. Keep doing good. For in due time, you will receive an inheritance. It's, so, it's like it, when we're serving God, we don't worry about the outcome. The pressure's on him. The pressure's on him. Our job is to do it and do it to help people because we love people. It moves over now. Now this is where I really want to get the heavy lifting done. In our love, and we're serving from a place of love, but this is where it gets really exciting. We serve God as his kids. You know, there's a, we've got a guy that comes cuts our lawn. Don't judge me. Oh, it's just not my thing. No, honestly, I cut the lawn. It looks like a kid that's cut his own hair. <laughs> True story. Takes me two hours and it looks like a kid that's cut his own hair. So we get a guy that comes in and does it. We, he won't come and do that because he cares about my lawn. I mean, he's a great guy. He's a really nice guy. He comes and gives it because we've got a we've got a, a financial agreement where he comes and does it for a certain amount of money, and then he takes it and goes and cuts the next person's lawn for the same sort of deal, like and that's fine and that's great, but when I was doing it, it's because it was my family, my house. When my kids get out and pull the weeds, and, and do it, that's because they're, they're the family. And like sometimes I'll ask for money for it. I'm like, well. Like, so what, you want me to give you money to clean your house? But this is a place where we are interacting as kids, and, and it's so important. Now, do you ever get those times where you feel like God's setting you up? Where you just see those little things happening through life, and you, after a little bit, you're like, I feel like God's setting me up, or something will happen, and you look back and you think, God was just setting me up like a three-card trick. Now, listen to this. There's this story in Matthew, and it's one of the most bizarre stories in the Bible, and it makes no sense unless you put unless you really dig into it. Matthew chapter 17 and 24. After Jesus and his disciples had arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and said, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? He asked. From whom do you the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes from their own children or from others from others peter answered then the children are exempt peter said to him that's no, sorry, jesus said to him but so that we might not cause offense go to the lake throw out your line take the first fish you catch open its mouth and you will find a four drachma coin take it and give it to them for my tax and yours Weird story, super weird story. A lot of I've heard it taught, and there is lots of different little things we can pull out of it, like God controls the fish in the sea, God can make money come from nothing. If you've got need, God can meet it in weird sort of ways, and it's exciting, and that's cool. Yes, yes, yes. I really don't think that's what this story is about. I'm not saying none of that's right, and you can't. You, that's not what this story is about. You see, because there's a three card trick getting played here, and this is what I want you to show you, and. and if you get it before I get it to it, don't shout it out and wreck it for everybody else. So this is Matthew 17, 24. We're going to start at Matthew 16 and verse 13. And then this is where Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But, uh, but what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Gosh, I love that when God's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, now we're talking about you specifically. You, you know, but he's, don't go forget, he's the one that said, well, who, what does everyone else say? So it's not like they were dodging it, but now he's like, let's just tighten the focus. Now we're moving it down to you. Who do you, and then Peter, Simon, Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. 
Jesus replies, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this is not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Next chapter, chapter 17, which is the same chapter of the fishing story. But starting at verse 1. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. Where there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Just then they appeared before Moses and Elijah, taking, uh, talking with Jesus. Just then appeared before them Moses and Elijah. Just for context, Moses and Elijah had been dead for hundreds and hundreds of years prior to this. So this is like a supernatural incarnation of these prophets from old coming, like being just transfigured onto the mount, like full on hectic experience. Talking with Jesus, Peter said to the Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. While he was still speaking, sometimes God will just cut you off because it's just like, oh, your conversation here is not necessary. Stop it. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Has anyone got it yet? Matthew 16, Revelation. By Revelation, Peter said, you are the son of God. God spoke to his spirit and he understood in his mind and spoke it out. He understood in his heart and spoke it out. Touch later, he's on a mountain and Jesus starts glowing and weird stuff happens and then God speaks from heaven and says, this is my son. Peter by this moment is in no doubt whatsoever that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. He has got no ifs or buts about it. He is like, this dude is son of the God who made it all and he's here in human form and he's my friend and he's just here and he's God in human flesh. He's just like, whoa, this is the son, this is the son of God. Full on hectic. He's at this point operating with such a revelation and understanding about the personhood of Jesus, the position of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the sonship of Jesus. And, that, and then this is where the three tra card trick comes into it because we're back fishing with Jesus. And Jesus says to Peter, who do kings collect tax from? Verse... 25 says this what do you think simon he asked from whom do the kings of the earth collect taxes from can we get verse 25 of, ch of chapter 17 up please what do you think simon he asked from whom do the kings of the earth collect taxes from the sun no it doesn't say the sun it says their own children, plural, plural, plural. Not the son, it says their own children or from others. From others, Peter answered. Next verse. Then the children, plural, are exempt. Jesus said to him, but so that we, we, you and me, may not cause offense, go to the lake, do your weird fishing thing, get the money, Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours, for the kids, for the, for the children of God. You and me, children of God. Peter was the, nobody on planet earth at that time was better positioned to understand that Jesus Christ was the son of God. And Jesus is saying to him, so are you, mate. That is where God wants us to operate from in serving. That's where he calls you and me to operate from as children of his. There. Come on. You might never ever hear something better than that in your entire life. Whew. And then we move down to Romans 18. Sorry, Romans 8. For, uh, Romans 8, 14 says this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. You have uh, The spirit you've received does not make you slaves so that you live again in fear. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. By him we cry, Abba.
next verse says, The Spirit himself testifies that we, that with our spirit, that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share his sufferings in order that we may also share his glory. This spirit that taught us that we're sons is a really key part here. Can we just go up to verse... 15, Susan, Romans 8, 15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live again in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought your adoption to sonship. And by him we might cry, Abba, Father. The way you parent your kids matters because it teaches them what God's like. Abba is a Hebrew word for daddy. The Hebrew word for daddy. God wants you to understand that as much as he's the creator God, he's daddy, it matters. But then we move down to say, if you're a son, you're an heir. What does that mean? It means you own it. It means you own all of it. Like, it's yours. <laughs> you know the difference between an employee and an owner in a company? Have you ever owned your own company or been a boss in a company where if you take the day off, there is nobody filling your spot. You know, like it's like, oh, you know, I, I've got, you know, a team that work with me and I'll get texts at weird hours of the morning. Oh, sorry, I'm sick. I'm like, okay, and that's it. They're, just, they're done now. They're going back to sleep. Little thermometer hanging out their mouth. The thing there, the lem sip and the feet up and the telly on and you know, down the beach or whatever sick means. And that's it. They're not thinking about this again until they, the next day they're rocking up. When it's your place, if you don't do it, it doesn't happen. Like, it doesn't happen. If you don't do it, it doesn't happen. Like, there is no someone else that will do it. There is, and, and there's this story in, uh, in John, uh, chapter 10 and verse 11, and it says this, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. You don't have to be the owner to carry yourself like a son. You don't have to be the owner to carry yourself like an owner. You don't have to be. God calls us to, he says, I own it all, but I want you to live here like you're in charge. What does that mean? That means take responsibility, take personal responsibility for whatever is in your charge. For whatever you come across, take personal responsibility for it. Like one of the things that we in, in church is, is we, you know, serving on team is, is like, we just lose the example of calling in sick again. Like, I mean, sure, there are, you know, urgent situations that come up and people are happy to help out. But, you know, let's just say something comes up on one of your rosters, oh, I can't do something. It's like, okay, cool who did you organize a swap with you know it's like it's your thing you you're taking personal responsibility for your role or someone should do that you're right did you, you're someone you know uh, even um you know it's a sm small matter of just like walking over rubbish uh, you, you don't walk over rubbish in your own house well i mean the kids do probably some of the guys do ladies don't walk over <laughs> like didn't you see that how could you not have seen that so i just didn't see that but when it's your place and your responsibility, you don't walk over it. You'll never ever see a boss at work walk over rubbish. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. You'll see a hired hand walk over rubbish. You'll see someone who is just there for the money and just punching the clock and punching out, doing as little as they can to get their paycheck, walk over, for, walk over rubbish. But you'll never see someone who cares about what they're doing. Someone who cares about the sheep. You'll never see someone who cares about the sheep 
cutting corners. You just won't see it. It's the difference between a child and a, and, and a hired hand. They're different. And God's saying, hey, I want you to come from that place. And I'm just going to close it now because I just think, I think that's, uh, this is the foundation, the platform we're put down for the rest of this series. And I think God wants us to be, all right, as we carry on through here, we're going to be understanding what it is to serve our families, serve in our workplaces, serve in our schools, serve in our ministries, in our church, the way that God wants to be served. A really healthy way that God wants to be served in a way that's actually going to bless him. Amen? Amen. Can I just get every head bowed and every eye closed? I know we started, this is a series on serving God and how to do certain things the way that he likes it done. You know that story I was just I just read in in John ten that spoke about the the shepherd with the sheep. They started verse eleven. You know the very verse before that says this. This is Jesus talking. My purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. That's what Jesus is saying. His purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life. This is the trade-off of serving God. We give him everything. He gives us so much more. But that's what he wants. He's calling us into that life. And if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus before, to enter into this rich and satisfying life, then I'm going to give you the opportunity now. And we're just going to pray a simple prayer. And that prayer is going to be, we're going to just actually say, God, today... I'm choosing to live my life your way. I'm inviting you into my life. And if you're praying this for the first time, I just ask that you mean it with all of your heart. So I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to invite the whole church just to repeat after me. And if you're praying for the first time, just mean it with all of your heart. All right, just repeat after me, guys. Dear God, today I choose to follow you. Forgive me for living life my own way. Give me your grace to live this new life. From today forwards, I will follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, the scripture says you were born again. A new life started. And if that was you, I just would invite you just to slip your hand in the air because I would like to be able to pray with you personally afterwards, give you some resources. If you're online, please let us know. We will follow up with you and get some resources to you. But if, that, if you prayed that for the first time, please just slip your hand in the air so I can see it. No one's looking around. I'd love to be able to pray with you personally afterwards. If you're online... Please let us know. We would love to get you started on this journey. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I'm going to pray for us all as we start this series. Lord, I just thank you that the men and women, children here, our hearts are to serve you. We want to show our love for you in a way that is how you receive it. To tell you that we love you in a way that you hear it. Lord, and as much as we don't do this for a reward, we're so blessed to know that you do reward us as we serve you. As we start this series, Lord, I pray that we grow in understanding what it is to serve you, how to serve you in really effective ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we're just going to just stand.